Well, one of the things I, I think the major thing I've learned is how much I don't know. Um, but there's so many more layers and, and depths to, um, in the word. It's just to savor and to explore. Um, I, I've just, until I started these classes, I was a lot more surface because that's all I knew. I mean, I, I wanted to learn deeper things, but I didn't have really the language skills or didn't know. It does, doesn't show up in English, some of the, the really deeper, deeper things. And um, I started coming probably two and a half years ago. Something. It's been at least three. Yeah, it's been a while, and I, I was only going to do the Hebrew because I didn't want to overdo it, and because I, I thought, oh, this is going to be so hard. But to be very honest, I have never <laughs> once studied at home, um, or reviewed grammar, or or done those kinds of things. Um, though I'm actually starting to want to do that to to to, to solidify it in my mind. Um, but it's amazing what I have learned just being here and, and just absorbing it. And the very first time I was here, um, I heard the speech about just letting it wash over you and just letting it absorb. Don't worry about what you don't know. Just pick up what's one thing here, one thing here, one thing here. And I've been doing that. And it's amazing what I can actually, um, what I know now. But I know, and it, it, it's exciting to me, and I, I talk about these classes all the time <laughs> with my friends. I actually got my husband to start coming. Um, I'm so excited wh about what I'm learning. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a joy. It is a total joy to learn these things and to learn the Word and to learn... Um, well, not so much the grammar kind of stuff. I, I'm still having you know, I, that's still over my head. But to learn the meaning and, and the precision with which the Lord planned His word, the part that's written in Hebrew and then the part that's written in Greek, and He d chose those languages before all time, just like He chose everything before all time, and it just—it's remarkable. And it's exciting, and it's refreshing, and it's nurturing, and nourishing, and I love it. That's all I can say. Um, Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you that we've um, gathered here to learn and, and to um, jump into your word another time. Lord, I just ask that you be with us and with our minds, and that you'll just be with Dr. Jim and uh, just teach us what you'd have us learn today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Karen. We're in the book of We Elay Shemot. We Elay Shemot. And we know what that means now, don't we? But for those out there in the world that don't, what does We Elay Shemot mean, uh, Pamela? And these names, and these names. That's what it was in Hebrew. It's not that in English. It's Exodus in English. And where do we get Exodus in English from? From the Greek Septuagint. What does the word uh, Exodus mean? The way out. All right. What is the word in Lakota for Exodus? Hantayo. <laughs> All right. Exodus. 17 and verse 3. Exodus 17 and verse 3. We're almost finished with this. I've been going to come down and make some more copies of it so you can go on a little bit further. I think we have here to uh, Exodus 18 and verse 18. And uh, there's the next volume right there. I didn't know whether I'd run out tonight or not. Well, Israel is grumbling against Moses. Israel is grumbling against Moses and having a fit. They just want their cake and eat it too. They left slavery. They have left slavery. And now they're free. They're in the wilderness. But they're worried that God can't take care of them. They've seen all the miracles in Egypt. How that he overcame all the gods. 
and provided for them or protect them in the middle of all of this catastrophe, famine, uh, pestilence of all sorts as God fought all those gods of Egypt and yet they didn't believe yet there were many believers that left Egypt lost or not I, I, I said that wrong there were many people that weren't believers that left Egypt they just went with the crowd there's a lot of people that join churches that are not believers they just go with the crowd and just because you're a member of so-and-so church or First Presbyterian Church or First Baptist Church or anything else, you want to know whether you've had a personal relationship with God yourself, not through your mother, your father, your godmother, your godfather, or anybody else. You have to have a personal relationship with God. You have to establish that by repenting and calling upon Him to save your soul. That's step one. Then from then on, that's when you can follow the Lord in baptism and uh, in service. And here we are with a lot of ungodly buzzards hanging around Moses. Why, it's ma, sham, ha'am, lam ma'im, why, yali, u. Yeah, low, that is low. Why y'all low? Ha'am, all Moshe, Wyomer, Lima'ah, Ze, He, El, Tanu, Mim, Mitzrayim, Lihamit, Othi, Wiet, Bane, Wiet, Mikne, Bats, Sama. All right. Wayitzma. And thirsted and kept on thirsting there the people. Ha'am. And this word here, Ha'am, there, what is this idea of people? Family. Amelia, family. All right. The family of God is what we're really talking about. All this family here. And it's actually like a tribe, a big, large tribe. Now, ha on the front of, of Am there is what? That's what you call a what? A whole horisticon our throne. Now, I just said that in Greek. What is it? The definite article. All right? And uh, we on the front of Yitzma is what? That's a conjunction. That's and. All right? And then... La Mayim, La Mayim. What's Lemet on the front of that? Preposition. Preposition. All right. So we are seeing how God is putting these words together in this language. God designed these languages. People have asked me many, many times, what language do you think we'll speak in eternity? And I said, maybe Hebrew. I don't know. Maybe Hebrew. So we're getting a uh, kindergarten education in Hebrew, if that's the language. Yalen and murmured he murmured third person masculine singular if L while consecutive per and perfect now this he there is third person masculine and singular isn't it why is it third person masculine and singular instead of third person plural because the people are looked upon as a unit one force okay and murmured the people Grammatically, that is incorrect in our language. But it's looking at as a unit, as a whole bunch. All of them were standing against Moses as a army. It's supposed to be the army of the Lord, but by now they're an army of the devil. <laughs> against Allah. All. What is that word, all, there, Brother Roger? Against a preposition. Another preposition. Against. All. What would that be in uh, in Greek? Ace. Ace, yeah. Ace or pros, yeah, in Greek. Moshe, and Moshe means to rescue or to draw out. Wyomer. Wyomer, the wow on the front of that is what? That's an and, that's a conjunction. And he said and kept on saying, third person, master, senior, cal, 
while wow, consecutive and perfect. The while wow, consecutive and perfect is like a, a historic, something historical. It happened. But it happened during a period of time. That's while wow, consecutive and perfect. Okay? And he said and had kept on saying, Lima, Lima. Here we have two little words put together. Le is what? Lamath is what? That's a preposition. And then what about ma? What or why? What or why? That's an interrogative. An interrogative pronoun. Or an interrogative, interrogative pronominal adjective. And uh, let's see if I can grab it here real quick. Ma. The interrogative and indefinite pronoun. Right there, on page uh, 113 in uh, Gesenius Hebrew Grammar. Tells you all about Gesenius is, is the greatest Hebrew grammar. It is the most uh, extensive. It's like A.T. Robertson's uh, uh, big grammar in Greek. The interrogative and definite pronouns. The interrogative pronoun is me, which is who. Of persons, even plurals, sometimes of things, or whatever. To whom? To what? It's an indefinite interrogative pronoun that we see. And here we have a preposition with a pronoun together. Preposition with a pronoun. Lima. To what? Or to why? Is what it literally says. Ze. That's a demonstrative pronoun. Ze is. What would it be in Greek? Tauta, 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 tauta in Greek. This. And then you have brought us. Look at that. You have brought us. He elitanu. You have brought us. Second person masculine, singular, hifal, perfect. You have brought us. The suffix is first person construct plural. You have brought us from Mem Mitzrayim. Look at that word, Mem Mitzrayim. We have that doggish in there that doubles it, don't we? All right. Mem Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means what? Of course, it's translated Egypt, but what does it mean? Canals and river banks. Land of red mud and canal banks. All right. Because it was a Agricultural society that did not depend upon rain. They irrigated the land, which was not very, this wasn't done all, everywhere. This was early irrigation. La Hamet. La Hamet. To kill. Look at that, to kill. That comes from Mioth. Look at that word Mioth down there. See that three uh, uh, letter root down there, 559 and 562 in the analytical or in the lexicons? Uh, me, you come to kill me, and we at. You only translate the end part of that. Uh, sons of me and my sons, and sons of me are in my sons. What does the word son mean? All right, according to a pattern. Benoth, daughters according to a pattern. All right, and then we at and. Mikne, Mikne. What does Mikne mean? All right. And my movable property. What is movable property? What is movable property? This is in the genitive case. My stuff, genitive, case of possession. Okay. My movable, pro my movable property. Livestock, slaves. Anything that you can carry off. Can you carry off land? No. Real estate was not considered much back then. Only what you can carry in your hand. Real property. Real property, what we call wealth, was what you could carry. They had begun to, to use silver and gold. Okay? But wealth, I mean, silver and gold can't do you any good. You, have any of you eaten gold? Huh? I have seen people eat gold. You know how they eat gold? They take chocolate and they put this gold film over it, really fine film. They'll 
put it on there somehow or another, and then you eat real gold. All right? Uh, now, people want to do that. They want to eat their wealth, okay? And, and they do this with chocolate candy, sometimes cakes and things like this. They will do this like that. But gold can't feed you. It can't feed you. In the tribulation period, gold and silver won't be worth anything. Nothing. You can't buy anything with it. Gold and silver is worthless. There's a fad going around right now. Invest in uh, gold, silver, and lead bullets. <laughs> They're going to fight a revolution, you know. I'm going to guarantee you when the Antichrist comes on the scene, forget all of that. You won't have any... They're not going, that's not going to be allowed, period. Forget it. You better be saved and get out of here first. Movable property. Everything that you can carry around that is real estate. We talk about real estate. Real property. The old cowboys. Back in the old days. You know what was more important to a cowboy than anything else? What was the most important? Huh? Horse? Well, his horse was very important, but that was dispensable. His pistol? His pistol was very important, and his rifle. They had a lot more rifles than pistols, okay? And in their rifles, they would take gold and silver coins and sometimes roll up uh, dollar bills or $20 or whatever after they began to print them. They would take the butt plate off of a rifle and they would take and stu stuff it full of that, and that was their bank. Mm. Because a cowboy, the last thing that he's going to give up when his life is gone is his gun. He's not going to, that's his protection. And out on the range and wherever you were, that gun was the difference between life and death so many times. So the last thing that he's going to give up is his rifle. I have a rifle at home that I own two times. I owned it in 1965 and I own it now. And I saw it in a gun show, and I asked the guy. It's a very special rifle. It's a, it's a Winchester, model 94, but it's a breakdown when it un the barrel unscrews and comes off from the action, like a model 12 Winchester, which pops apart. And you could put it in a case, a carrying They had leather carrying cases for these. Well, a guy came to my house and um, sold that to me in 1965. I was working in the oil fields or Sunland Refinery or something at that time. Anyway, he, he gave it to me for a very, very cheap price. I think I gave him $75 for it. The gun was probably worth two or three hundred, four hundred, five hundred dollars back then because it's special. They didn't make very many of them. It's a long one. It's 26 inch barrel. It has a half hex, half octagon and half round barrel. That's a that's a special option. It has an ivory bead front sight, another special option. It has a triple folding rear sight, another special option. It has a shotgun butt instead of the curb butt, another option. It has a half magazine, which is another option. All these options, and then it has a Lyman flip-up sight like quickly down under on the back of it. And you can lay the front sights down so you can see through this deal. Well, I looked at that rifle when I saw it at the gun show, and I said, what do you think chances are all those options on the gun? How many guns do you think they made like that? And he said, probably not very many. I said, well, I owned a gun just like that in 1965. And when I bought it, I knew it was an old gun because it was, it was 61 years old in 1965. See, this is back, goes back to the cowboy days. When I grew up, I was still seeing cowboys. You have to realize that. Cowboys were still on the streets when I, when I was little. They were still driving the horses down the, the, the ice wagons, you know, where they deliver the ice for the ice boxes, which you don't even know what they are today. They were drying them down in a buckboard with a tarp over it and tarp down below and a tarp on top of it to keep the ice from melting, and they'd bring in 5 or 10, 15, 20 pounds to your house and stuff. And then cowboys were still riding. I knew this one old cowboy named Allen. He used to come down there where I was a wrangler at Ragsdale Stabing, uh, Stables, and he'd, dry, he'd ride his old horse in. And he'd ride it for about a mile, where the Edison Drive-In Theater was where he lived. He lived in a, in a house there in that big pasture with that horse's pasture. This horse was about 20 years old. He was over 100, and he rode that horse. He never drove a car. He said he, he got his wife a car, and that, I think she had about a 1949 uh, Ford or something. It was pretty new back then. But he had this 49, 
And he said, I, she drives and I pray. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it was. He came from the Civil War times. And he'd ride that horse down and he'd go over there to this soda pop machine, which was in water back then. They, they had water in them, you know, that's how they got coal. And he'd go over there and pull out a red soda water. He carried his rifle and his pistol with him all the time. And I'll just tell you that I bet he had money either in one of those cylinders in that Colt single action armory or in the butt of that rifle. I took this rifle and when I got it, this guy brought it to me and I knew the family because my sister had gone with their cousin. That was her first boyfriend. And so I bought the gun and about two or three weeks later I never shot the gun, still haven't shot the gun. Anyway, the family came back and they wanted to know if I had the gun. I said, yes, I have the gun. But in the meanwhile, I'd taken the stock off of it, and inside it looked like a dollar bill, and I should have brought that. It, looked, it said one right on it. And I said, well, this is old silver certificate or gold certificate or something back then. Well, I unfolded it, and it was a 1913 and 1914 California hunting license. It was printed just like a dollar bill. Hmm. I thought I was going to get a silver certificate or something there. Sometimes it would be 50 or $100 bills or rolls of 20s in there. You know, there's usually a, a hole in the stock. Well, I took it out, and it was a little rusty in there, so I didn't put it, and it was damp. So I scrapped the side off and, and put it back in there, and I put that in my keepsake, that little piece of paper. That was her great-grandfather. That's in 1965. Well, I had that thing all these years. I had it in a little box. When they came and got the gun, I forgot to give it to them but they bought the gun back because the guy had bought, brought, bought the gun or taken the gun without permission. They didn't want to turn it in for stolen because it's their family. But they wanted the gun back. Anyway, I guess all of them are dead now. I got the gun, and I went home after I got traded to the gun, and I took the back stock off, and there's where I scraped the rust off of it, and there is where the California hunting, and, or the hunting license was mm. with his name on it and everything. I still have that. That was valuable. That was real estate to them. This was the most valuable thing that a cowboy had. His saddle. His saddle was another thing. That was very important to him. Well, this is real estate we're talking about here. Movable property. Whatever they had back then, their bows, their arrows, that was very, very good. Their, their staffs. <coughs> a shepherd's staff. What did a shepherd's staff have on it? Say that again, brother. Lineage. The lineage of his family. That staff was usually handed down from, from father to son. Like Noah's and like Adam's rod was handed down from father to son. You've got us out here, and you're going to destroy our movable property. Well, our sheep and goats and cattle and camels, elephants, whatever they had, is going to die. With thirst. Ba bots sama with thirst. Seventeen four. Seventeen and verse four. Why Yitzak Moshe El Hadavar Lemor Ma Ese Laam Haze Od Miat. You see Kaluni. And he cried. Third person, Mass and Senior, Cal Wal, consecutive perfect. He cried and kept on crying, Moses. Unto Jehovah. Ha the bar. I want to look at that one. Ha the bar. That's the word. That's the name of God. That's the word. After the Jews received the law of God, it says, You shall not use the Lord thy God's name in vain. And they were ever afraid after that on to speak it. So here we have the Hathavar, which is the legend of Hologos. Okay? Lemor. Saying, Cal infinitive construct. Remember what that lameth on the front of that word is there, brother? Right off the bat, what does it tell you? That's probably going to be an infinitive. Okay. Yeah, probably going to be an infinity. When you see the little math on the front of it, that's two, isn't it? Two, not two or four, usually in the dative or the instrumental case. All right, right here it turns it into an infinity, along with a few other things. 
Now we have an interrogative pronoun, indefinite interrogative pronoun, ma. All right, what? I shall keep on doing. First person construct, senior, cal, imperfect. What shall I keep on doing? To people. All right, now here we have this in the dative case. Remember all of those cases in Greek? We have almost the duplication of them in Hebrew. Nominative, the case of what? Nominative is a case of what? Action. Subject. Oh. Genitive, case of possession. Oblative, the case of origin. Locative, that's in something. That's the case that means inside of something. All right. Locative, instrumental, with, by, or for, and then the dative is Locative, instrumental, dative, dative is two or four, which we have right here. That's the dative case. All right. And then we have the accusative. That's the direct object, the case of the object, all right, the accusative case. And then we have the evocative case, case of address in Hebrew and Greek. You have to, to, to understand Greek, you have to know some Hebrew because there's too many Hebrewisms in it. To understand Hebrew thoroughly, you have to know that giant Greek grammar, the Greek gra grammar that explains so many things, unless you know Greek. When you read this Gesenius Greek grammar, they expect you to be educated. You have to know Latin. It's a must necessity. You have to know some German. You definitely have to know Greek and Hebrew because half, the, half of the explanations are in those languages. Some of Kyle and DeLeach will go on for pages without ever saying one word in English. It will be German or Latin. They will make long quotations in the Latin Vulgate or in the Greek Septuagint. Kyle and DeLeach is a, is a tremendous ten-volume commentary on the Old Testament, by the way. Almost all preachers have one in their, in their library whether they can read it or not. <laughs> they used to educate us old fossils so we could read things like that. Now they come to us to find out what's there. They ought to learn it. <laughs> learn those things. But you know what that means? That means elbow grease in the cranium. <laughs> Hard work. And he cried Moses unto Jehovah saying, and here we have the word Leomer, Lemor again, saying, What I shall keep on doing to this people still. Look at that word still. Old. Still. Few. This is what we call a diminutive. Few, and they shall have stoned me. All right. They shall have stoned me. They are going to stone me. It's a call. They want to stone me. 17 verse 5. 17 and verse 5. Wyomer, Hadavar, El Moshe, Avor, Lifne, Haam, Wikach, Itika, Muzikne, Yisrael, Yumatika, Asher, Hikita, Bo, Et, Hayor, Ka, Bayadika, Wehalikita. And he said, and kept on saying, Jehovah unto Moses. These are the words of God. This is Jehovah's words now. You want to hear what he said? You can hear it in, he in Hebrew now. That was, that was Jehovah's words. That's what he said. And he said, Jehovah unto Moses. Look at this word unto there. That's L, isn't it? What does that word L there mean? You remember, Sharon, what that word is? That's a Hebrew preposition, all right? L, it can be what? It can also be an adverb of negation, and what else can it be? God. The name of God, all right, or God. Moses, pass over, masculine, senior, cal, imperative, pass over to the face, go to the face of, lifene, lifene, preposition to, dative case, the face. What does face really mean? Pene, what does that really mean? 
the nose, the nose. Go to the very nose. All right, what does that pay there uh, represent? What does a pay represent? Mouth uh, the mouth with a tongue in it. All right? And it's a little longer than the cough. All right? Lifane, to the face of the people, ha'am. And take, take, masculine scene or cowl imperative, with you, itika, elders, geriatric people. Geri it's, it's geriatric in Greek. All right? Here is mezigne. This is uh, old people. Old people. Page 278 in that Hebrew lexicon right over there, Brown Driver and Briggs. Old people of Israel. Who are these old people? The fathers of different families. The fathers of different families. You, Matika, and your what? Staff. That rod. That rod. This is a very important rod in it. This is a rod of authority. Which, look at this little relative prone, uh, pronoun here, this little particle of relation, a relative pronoun. Asher. Asher. Hikita. Hikita. And you have struck with him, with this rod, and when you have struck, look at second person, master, senior, hifa, el, perfect. When you have struck with him, the stream take in your hand and you will have walked. You will have walked. Now he's going to strike and make a stream of water come out with this rod, with this rod of God. Okay? This rod has great powers in it. Where is that rod today? In the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, yes. Where, where in the Bible does it talk about the location of the Ark in Noah? Somebody, I mean, not Noah, Moses. Uh, somebody was asking me the other day. Where in the Bible does it talk about the what now? Um, where um, the priest took and buried the Ark. Of well, Jeremiah. Okay. Okay, that's in Second Maccabees, the second chapter. That's a history. Okay. Yeah, that's in the Apocrypha. All right. It tells you that all the Jews, re re they recognize that as a true historical document. Okay. Uh, we're not saying it's inspired or anything like that, but it was. it's supposed to be in the King James Bible, and uh, it was never supposed to be left out or else whoever printed it would be dead. They'd be killed. They would be beheaded. Okay. Second Maccabees, the second chapter, I do not have it with me or I would read it to you right now. All right, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. We're talking about the rod that's in the Ark of the Covenant. And you will have walked. Second person, masculine, senior, cow, wow, consecutive, perfect. All right. 17 and verse 6. Hene, Omid, Lefanika, Sham, Al, Hatsur, Bicharev, Wehikita, Batsur, Wayatsu, Wayatsu, Memenu, Mayim, Wishata, Haam, Wayaas, Ken, Moshe, Leene, Zigne, Yisrael, Hine. Behold, this is what we call a little interjection here. All right, page 199 in Davidson's analytical Hebrew lexicon. Behold, standing, masculine, senior, cow, so standing before your face. Look at that, lefanika, before the face of you. What makes that in the genitive case? What makes that in the genitive case? Brother Roger, you know what puts that in the genitive case? The face of possession? Um, is it, is it uh, the last letter of that uh, word? Yeah, the cough. The cough. Yeah, the cough final. That's what puts it in the genitive case. So that's the genitive case. Le, preposition, phanika. Before the face of you. Okay? Your face. 
literally the face of you, sham, and sham means what? That's an adverb of place right here, this little sham, okay? Sham means what? Yeah. Over there. And poem means here. Yes, <laughs> all right. Sham, over there, and sham also where we get the name word sham or name or monument or pillar, okay? Sh over there, ale upon, what would be ale in, in, in Greek? Upon? Epi. 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 Page 153 and 54. Epi. Upon hot sewer. Upon the rock. Upon the rock in Horeb. In Horeb. Bicharev. In Horeb. And you shall have struck. Look at that. We hikita. We hikita. We hikita. See, it's got a double ki. ki. We hikita. And you shall have struck the rock. Batsur. And they shall have gone out from him. Look at that. You know what? This is very beautiful. Who is the rock? that he struck. Jesus. Jesus is the rock that followed Israel in the wilderness. Now, if you get into the rabbinical writings in the Mishnah and the Talmud, they will say that this was a gigantic rock that literally followed Israel in the wilderness. Do you, do you know that, Roger? Just because you said it. Okay. Uh, it, you will find that this Israel, the rabbi, said that this rock followed them in all of their goings. This rock followed them, and water flowed from that rock. And some, uh, and I, I'm not putting any uh, credence to this situation, but I have a book at home that will show you the rock and where water flowed out of it, and they say this is a rock that followed Moses in the back in, in the wilderness. I really don't think so, but maybe it could be, but I doubt it. <laughs> but that's what they say, the rock followed them in the wilderness. But we find out that there was at least two rocks, wasn't there? More than one rock. Okay? And the rock in Horeb. And, and you shall have struck the rock, and they shall have gone out from him waters. Maim, waters. And he shall have drunk the people. All right? It's looking at the people as a what? As a unit. And he did, in this matter, this is word can, this is a little adjective, thusly or thus, okay? Moses, before the eyes, le ene, before the eyes of the elders of Israel, before the eyes. He went, remember, they took these old geriatric guys out there, they took them out there, and they're going to be representatives because, you know, there's a lot of people there, a million more people, I don't know how many was there. Some people say one to three million, something like that. Some were, it was a lot of people. So they couldn't take all of them out there, but they did this, and then the waters flowed, and everybody got a drink. So everybody was happy for at least maybe three hours <laughs> <laughs> before they started whining about something else. Brother Roger. Well, um, I'm not quite sure the story, but one time he struck the rock and he wasn't supposed no, to. No, he was supposed to speak to it. Okay. Okay, we're going to get to that. that. Come later? That comes later. That was the other rock. Okay. Some people say same rock. I think it was another rock. Because I think this rock kept flowing water. I think the water just kept flowing from this rock. This rock represented New Jerusalem where the river of the waters of life flow from New Jerusalem out into the, into the whole earth forever in eternity future. We studied about that last week, remember, where the wa river of water of life flowed out from the from the throne room of God, which represents the dwelling place of Jesus, Jehovah, and flows out just like this rock represented Jesus and those waters of life. And Jesus, when they were getting ready to pour the drink offering there in, in Jerusalem, he said, he stood up and he says, Come unto me, you all that ye that thirst, and I'll give in to you waters that you'll never need any more water again. That'll satisfy you forever. These people were not satisfied with the waters forever. Okay, they just weren't satisfied. 
Now we're going to go to uh, another place in the wilderness. And this is why I don't think the rock followed them everywhere. Okay? I think that rock was there, and I think the water flowed out of that rock, and that rock represented Christ, and the water itself represented Christ also. He said, I am the water of life. I am the light of the world. I am the true manna that came down from God out of heaven. Those things are all a type of him. He is the tabernacle. Primarily, the interpretation of that tabernacle up there is everything about it represents Christ. Secondary, everything about it represents the church in the church age. The temple of Solomon represents the church in the glory age in the millennium. Here. The millennium temple, the gates are locked. Did you know that? The millennium temple, the gates are locked. But in the eternal temple, or in, in, in New Jerusalem, the gates of, of New Jerusalem are locked here to keep the bad people out because they're still bad people. Still bad people. There's still bad demons, bad spirits, and everything else. And so it's locked. Even though Satan is locked up down here in the bottomless pit. Okay? But then in the eternal ages, there is no... There's no locks on the gates. All right? Let's go on a little bit further. 17 and verse 7. Yikra, Shem. Ha Makom. Masa. You mid Rabah. Al Riv Bene Yisrael. We all. Nasatam et Hadavar Lemor Hayesh Hadavar Biker Biker Benu Yama I I translated it, I didn't write it. All right. On I I made a mistake there. That's not not. Ein. Ein. All right. It means not. That's a little particle or adverb of negation, by the way. You ever, your mind ever play tricks with you like that, Brother Roger? Yeah, sure you, five minutes. About every five minutes? <laughs> Why, Yikra? See, we don't have proofreaders to go back and tell us when we make mistakes. He does it. I go back and correct his mistakes. Nobody goes back and corrects my mistakes except for me or some of you guys sometimes. Why, Yikra? All right. And he called and kept on calling the name of the place Masa. 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 And Meribah. You Meribah. Meribah means what? Because, and that means bitter. What name in, in, in what uh, woman's name comes from that? Mary. 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 Woman's name. What's a man's name? Mary. Miriam. Marion. All right. Because... Al, uh, because the fighting, the contention, the warring of the sons of Israel, and because to test them, look at this word, to test them, nasatam, P-L, infinitive construct, suffix, third person, masculine, plural, to test them, Jehovah. He's trying to find out what they're made out of. All right? What are you made out of? How many of you have been to tests? You ever been through a test? Once or twice. How many of you have taken a test? How many of you ever lock up on a test? <laughs> huh? My wife and my daughter, they have test fright so bad, I have never seen anything like it. When I took Marilyn to hit her ham radio test and to go to take her ham radio test, I mean it was total fright. Terrified. They were terrified. They took different tests, test, 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 and they would always just be scared to death, so scared they couldn't think, and they knew what they needed to know. Finally, I said, we're going to go, and we're going to go over to uh, Santa Barbara. Not Santa Barbara, but uh, San Luis Obispo. not San Luis Obispo, Santa Maria. 
they over there I said there's a bunch of people over there that are really nice we went to this uh, mobile home park they used this the the community center in there in this mobile home cart they got in there to get the test they were so relaxed both of them aced it no problem <laughs> boy I took him to a lot of tests sage fright testing Jehovah again ha the var is whole logos saying Cal infinitive construct saying is he Ha ish is Jehovah is he the him Jehovah in our midst literally it says the him the him the him the him Jehovah right in the middle of us Bikarvenu Bikarvenu right in the middle of us Meso in Greek right in the midst of us Jehovah if not if not M that's a little conjunctive word or a conditional particle if not adverb or particle of negation if not he came oh let's read this verse in, in Hebrew why of all Amalek, Waiela, Kim, Im, Israel, B. Rephidim. All right, B. Rephidim. And he came on Ama Amalek. What is this Amalek bunch of people? Amalek. Remember who they are? Amalek? Who's they, Amalek? Were they the guys that burn people? No, no, I got Amalekites. Seven hundred and sixty six. Seven hundred and sixty six. All right. This Amalek. Amalek. These are the Amalekites. And these people are very big and very scary. All right. Very big and very scary people. They frighten everybody. And he fought against Israel and Rephidim. Rephidim, remember what Rephidim means? What did Rephidim mean? Do you remember? We studied that last week or the week before. What was Rephidim? Rephidim. Rephidim, that's the prairie, remember? Out in the prairie, out in the plains. The prairie are the plains. So they f had a fight out in the plains with the Amal Amalekites. Now we have a 17 and verse 9. 17 and verse 9. Wyomer. Moshe. El Yehoshua. Bachar, Lanu, Abashim, Wetsi, Hilakem, Ba Amalek, Machar, Anoki, Nitzav, El, Rosh, Hakiva, Yumati, Ha Elohim, Biadi. All right. And he said Moses to Joshua. Joshua. What's Joshua mean? What does Joshua mean? Remember what that means, uh, Sharon? Joshua. Um, same as Jesus. Joshua. Same as Jesus. Same name as Jesus. Exactly. What does Joshua mean? Pam? What? Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Joshua means Jehovah saves. A uh, choose. Choose, Cal imperative, choose from us, Anishim, men, humankind. And go, masculine, singular, Cal imperative, and go, and wage war, cause to make war. All right? Masculine, singular, Nephal imperative, cause to wage war against Amalek. Amalek. 
against Amalek tomorrow. And I cause to be standing, masculine singular, Nephael participle, cause to be standing upon the head of the hill. And the staff, whose staff is this? Whose staff is it? All right, whose staff does it say it is here? Who owns this staff? Where did this staff come from? Well, it's God. The staff of God. This is the staff that God belong, that belongs to God. Why do you think they took the staff and put it in the Ark of the Covenant? Nobody else can have this. Nobody else can have this. You talk about something, the most valuable thing, the Raiders of the Lost Ark and all this kind of stuff. You see this? You know what the most important thing in that Ark of the Covenant is? It's not the manna. It's not the manna. It's not the law. What is it? It's the staff of God. This is the staff that, according to the book of Jasher, a history book, not inspired, but a history book. This is the staff that was handed down to Adam that represented his authority over the earth that God, it said that God held in his hand when he created the heavens and the earth staff of great power and authority and by the way the church has that staff of authority today in this world Matthew the 18th chapter not Peter not the Catholic church but the local visible New Testament churches have that authority in the world today that authority that Moses had is in that Ark of the Covenant next to the law I believe that that is a rod that will, Jesus will hold in his hand when he comes and takes it out of the Ark of the Covenant after he gets Israel straightened out. Israel's still got an economy in the place of God. All right. Choose men and go and wage war at the head of the hill, all Rosh of the hill, and the staff belonging to Elohim, God's staff. That's who belongs, who owns this staff, God's staff, in my hand. I'll have God's staff in my hand. Wayaas. Yehoshua. Ka'ashur. Amar. Lo. Moshe. Lehil. Lachem. Be Amalek. You, Moshe. Aharon. We chur, alu, rosh, hig, hig, giba. And he made Joshua. Just as. Look at that word. It comes from ki and asher. We have a particle relation there, and we have ki on the front of it. Just as, or because as, he had said to him, Moses. To wage war, Nephel, infinitive construct, against Amalek, be Amalek. These fearsome, terrible people, these Amalekites. Amalekites. And Moses and Aaron. You, Moshe, and Aharon. What does Aaron mean? Enlightened. And her. All right, and her. And her. And they had gone up to the head of the hill to the head of the hill means to the peak of the hill right up there on top they had gone up to the top of the hill <clears throat> I thought maybe I might have had something written down here about her her or Gilgal her or Gilgal means the hollow the hollow of Gilgal alright the hollow of Gilgal what's a hollow a depression a valley a depression a valley of Gilgal Gilgal is the hill or Geboa all right. 
Why we haya? 1711. Ka Ashar. Yarim. Moshe. Yado. We Gabar. Yisrael. We Ka Ashar. Yaniak. Yado. We Kabar. Amalek. And it had become just as. He kept on lifting, he kept on lifting. Look at that third person, Max and Senior, he fell in, imperfect. He kept on lifting Moses. His hand, he had become strong. All right. Third person, Max and Senior, Cal, while consecutive, perfect. He had become strong Israel. And when, Ka Ashur, now we have a conjunction. We have Ki and we have Ashur. And when are just as. He had kept on resting his hand, and he had become strong Amalek. When he couldn't hold it up, when he rested his hand, when he laid his hand down with a rod, Amalek became very strong. So there's a real tug of war out here. When Moses holds his hand up with the rod of God, the rod, God's rod, okay, this ought to settle whose rod this is, or where it came from. It's just as simple as that. Exodus 17 and verse 12. Wide, Moshe, Kebedim, Wayikchu, Evan, Wayasimu, Lakta, Wayeshev, Aliha, Weaharon, Wechur, Tamiku, Viado, Mize, Ichad, Yumize, Ichad, Wahi, Yado, Yumana, Ad, Bo, Hash, Shemesh. And hands, Wide, and hands, Moses. Moses' hands heavy, Kabidim, Kabidim. His hands were Kabidim, heavy. And they took, third person masculine plural, cow, while consecutive and perfect, and they took a stone, Evan, a stone. What was the word the stone in, 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 in Greek? Petra, Petra, Petra. They took a stone and they placed under him. And he sat. Boy, these guys were strong, aren't they? Put a stone under him so he could sit down. And upon her, upon the stone, upon the Petra, See that? And Aaron and her. All right. What's her mean? Huh? What's her mean? Huh? Hollow, but also it means white. White or pale. All right. And it means hollow also or white or pale. Uh, it means a, uh, a cave dweller. And they had supported and held up in his hands from this, look at that, from this, me and ze, from preposition, ze, demonstrative pronoun, one, numeral. And from that, one, he became his hands' firmness until came the sun, until the sun went down, until sunlight, all right? Helios is the Greek word in Greek for sun. 17 and verse 13. We'll go on here a little bit further and then we'll give her up for the next day. We are Chulosh. We ho, we hashua. Et, Amalek. We et, Amo, Lefne, Charev. And he prostrated himself. Weakened Joshua. Amalek. He calls them to fall down. To fall down. To to fall down in a worshipful manner toward him. You understand what it's talking about? They began to prostrate themselves down before Joshua. And Am Amalek had, did. And his people by the mouth of the sword. All right? The mouth of the sword. Now this sword is like a uh, 
double mouth sword of Revelation 2.16. Proverbs 5 and 4. Two mouth sword. What is a two mouth sword? What does a sword do when you hit somebody? It bites a chunk out of them. It cuts a chunk out of them. And they call it a double mouth sword because a sword, a double mouth, has got a blade on both sides. It cuts both directions. Cut in both directions. It's sharp on both edges. Okay? Like the double mouth sword. So they were swinging these double mouth swords. All right? Amalek means to work, to toil, to travail, to cause mischief, to cause terror. It means wretched. 766 in Brown Driver Briggs. And who this is, by the way, these are the grandsons of Esau. This is the grandson of Esau. This also are the cousins of those that were related to Herod. Herod. This is Herod's family. Let's read one more verse and then we will I'll turn you loose and we'll I'll try to to copy some more pages for your next little lesson. Wyomer, Hadavar, El Moshe Katov, Zot, Zikaron, Bas Sefer, Wisem, Biazene, Yehoshua, Ki Macha, Mche, Et, Zekar, Amalek, Mitechat, Hashemaim. And he said, Jehovah, Hadavar, look at that again, the whole logos, unto Moses, write, write this memorial. In, uh, now here we have this Basefer, Basefer, in a missive or a written account, or scribe, it means to scribe this down. See that word Sefer? The book of Jasher is Ha Sefer Yashur. All right? Let me show you that real quick. This is exactly the word. Sefer. See that? Sefer. Ha Sefer Yashur. Sefer means a scribe, to scribe it down. It's a history. Write it in a history book. That's what it means. Write it in a history book. Write this in a history book. And put or set, masculine, singular, cal imperative, in the ears of Joshua. Because to wipe out, cal infinitive, absolute, look at that word, mochach, I shall keep on, and remember it's Amalek. From underneath the heavens. I want you to have a history of this under the heavens. Where did we start tonight? 17 and verse 1. 17 and verse 3. To 17 and verse 14. Well, we ran along. You know, I write backwards. When I'm fooling around with Hebrew, I write everything backwards, even my English. Well, this is the last day of August in 2014. This day will never happen again. All right. Do you have any questions here? Any questions on this? Pamela, do you have a question? How about... Uh, Sharon, do you have any questions? Um, no, no. Not right now, huh? All right. We know who, belong, who the rod belongs to, don't we? I do. Yes. Okay, when he, he's talking about the people weighing prostate, yes. does that mean he killed them all? He slaughtered them, and, and the ones that were left were submissive. All right? He killed a bunch of them, and the ones that were left were submissive, and probably they killed them. A lot of times they didn't leave any survivors, leave no survivors, you know. And sometimes that's what they were supposed to do. Some of these people were so diseased with diseases that God did not want them left alive. And they would even take them and burn them to kill the disease that could be carried on. 
right? We don't know. A lot of people look at this period of time in, in, in the history of Israel and say that God was just bloodthirsty. He was a bloodthirsty savage. But he was getting rid of contamination. These people were heavily contaminated. There were some of them that came through. Name some of these that became into the lineage of Christ. Ruth, the Moabitess, and who else? A courtesan of old. Huh? Well, Tamer prayed like a courtesan. Who, who was the courtesan of old? Who was the one that... Rahab. Rahab. Rahab the courtesan. The high-class harlot. Okay? All right, so... God saved some of them. God always saves a few of the little people. He even watched over the animals in the book of Jonah, didn't he? Watched over the animals of Nineveh. He took had mercy upon them. Any other questions? Brother Roger? No? You're learning something? Oh, yeah. What did you get today? What did you get today? Well, um, I mean, some of the grammar, but more so um, the intent of God. Yeah, the intent. The intent. I want you to see the purpose. God's eternal purpose and God's unpreventable progress in all of this. God's eternal purpose and God's unpreventable progress. He always has a plan. As much as the people bickered against Moses, I mean, here's God showing them graphically, if he doesn't hold up his hands, you guys lose. That's right. So you better not pick on him. But, I mean, they do anyhow. Well, what was he holding up? God's rod that conquered all of Egypt and all of their gods. That was God's authority. And Moses had God's authority. And even when Aaron and Miriam turned against him, you know that happened. Aaron lost his life. Did you know that? God killed Aaron. God turned Miriam into a leper. These people, his closest family members, his brothers, or his brother and his sister were against him. And God wiped them out. All obstacles. They should have learned a lesson. But did they? A Jew today. They talk about the book of Exodus. And they read the book of Exodus and they talk about this. This, this book of Exodus is like the axle of all of Jewish history. But what does it say? You guys are dogs. <laughs> You're a bunch of rats. And if it wasn't for me and my mercy, you wouldn't exist. What they get out of that, they look there, and they twirl their mustaches and comb their beards and look holy. We're God's elect. You know what? Israel had a chance to be the bride of God. Israel will never be the bride of God ever again. They blew it. The whole Old Testament tells you one story. God give us that for examples or types. Don't do this because these guys were rascals. And you're not supposed to be rascals. You're supposed to be obedient children. They had some obedient children back in the Old Testament. Joshua, Caleb, Moses. Even Moses one time, one time Moses struck that rock, didn't he, when he was supposed to speak to it. Why? Why did God kill Moses because he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. The rock was a type of Christ, wasn't it? The first rock that was struck was a type of Christ's first coming when he was struck. The second type was his coming in glory. That's That he struck the type of Christ in glory which was against the violent it did violence against the type that that one was. He was supposed to speak to it, not to hit it. Okay? That answered your question on that one too, didn't it? Pamela, you got a question. Do you think you could get up here and give us a, a little of what this one did one of these days, if you feel like it? One of these days. <laughs> All right. Let's have a word of prayer. And I'm going to turn you loose on the world. Brother Roger, will you come up here and dismiss us in prayer, please?
Father, thank you for uh, this lesson. I hear myself in it so much where you you tell us what to do and I find reasons not to do it or I develop anger, resentment. It's a good lesson for me to listen to and to hear and remind myself. Thank you so much for bringing me here to hear these words. For those that couldn't be here tonight, please, please be with them and, and uh, heal them, and guide them, direct them. Be with us as we go out of here and take on the world. Guide us and direct us in your will and way. In your name I pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Go out and do something eternal.